Hello and welcome to this lecture on an NPTEL course entitled Introduction to Cultural Studies. We have already started looking at leotards and postmodern condition. Uh, we started with the introduction yesterday uh, in the last lecture and we'll continue with that today. So, and we'll finish the introduction and move on to the first chapter. But before we do that, we need to understand uh, the main premise of Leotard's essay and why we're reading this uh, for this particular course, Introduction to Cultural Studies. Now, we saw in the last lecture that Leotard offers a very interesting definition of postmodernism in general. It's more a definition of the postmodern attitude, the postmodern spirit, which it defines or describes as an incredulity towards meta narratives. So, any kind of meta narrative, whether it's a grand narrative of religion, uh, uh, politics, ideology, supremacy, race, etc. Uh, postmodernism instills a suspicion, uh, a suspension, and a suspicion uh, directed against those meta narratives. Right. So, uh, in, in 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 the place of meta narratives, we have local narratives, micro narratives, which are more uh, subversive in nature, which are more local in nature, which are sort of more uh, you know connected to the daily discourses of life rather than uh, connected to a grand discourse of uh, control, coercion, politics, or government. Now, uh, the key question then arises is what, I mean, the question of legitimation, uh, how do you legitimize certain kind of knowledge? Uh, and the process of legitimization is a process of a narrative becoming a grand narrative. A grand narrative can only happen uh, through legitimization. So, postmodernism also requires, also demands de legitimization. And this is what Lyotard talks about a great deal uh, in this particular book. So, the question of legitimization and delegitimization become uh, very, very important in the context of postmodernism. So, what is legitimized knowledge? What is delegitimized knowledge? Uh, you know, what are the what is the politics behind legitimization, the racial politics and linguistic politics, uh, the cultural politics, of course, the reason why I'm doing this uh, text in this particular course. Uh, and also, equally, how does the legitimized knowledge become delegitimized in certain historical epochs? And Lyotard spends a good deal of time talking about scientific knowledge, uh, which it contrasts with narrative knowledge, right? And that's something we'll talk about a great deal as we move on in the, in the main chapter, the introductory chapter. But right now, let's focus on the introduction before we move on to the first chapter. Let's focus on the introduction of Lyotard uh, writes in order to set out what he um, defines as postmodernism. Now, he talks about uh, postmodernism being an incredibility. It delegitimizes the grand narratives, etc. And then he asks this key question, which is on page uh, 15, 14 and 15, the last sentence in page 14, uh, which should be on the screen now. Where after the meta narratives can legitimacy reside? So after the meta narratives die, so suppose we say there are no meta narratives left, uh, postmodernism has um, sort of released an onslaught against meta narratives. Uh, there are no alternatives to race, uh, religion, faith, technology, science, etc. Everything becomes micro narratives, uh, which are disseminated across different kinds of media, uh, which can be consumed and disseminated and created and co created and recreated across different media. So, after that condition, where does legitimacy reside? That's a key question that Lyotard raises. All right, so. Uh, and then he goes on to ask in page 15, at the very opening of page 15, is legitimacy to be found in consensus obtained through discussion, as Eugen Habermas thinks? Now, Habermas, for some of you would know, uh, is a very important philosopher of the 20th century, and he has this very important you know, thesis called um, you know, uh, as, uh, modernity as an unfinished project. Now, according to Habermas, uh, modernity, which is obviously the best of the Enlightenment, the best of European Enlightenment, the best of rationality, the best of uh, you know, science, etc., uh, turned out to be an unfinished project. Now, uh, it's not very hard to see how modernity, as Habermas describes it, is quite essentially Eurocentric. Right? It is embedded in certain Eurocentric premises of you know, faith, religion, race, supremacy, uh, ideology, rationality, etc. So, in order to call modernity an unfinished project, you need to be, have a very nostalgic understanding of uh, Eurocentricity. And uh, Lyotard obviously is anti nostalgia. Uh, he is someone who doesn't really believe in this Euro European nostalgia of supremacy. So, he has issues with Habermas, which keeps coming up in this particular book. But for the purpose of our course, cultural studies, it's interesting to understand that how uh, Lyotard's definition of postmodernism offers an alternative understanding of modernity, an alternative understanding uh, of knowledge, of narratives, etc. So he takes issues with uh, Habermas way up, and he says that you know Haber this Habermasian idea of public space, this Habermasian idea of uh, discussions in public space, which through which will arrive at a consensus, through which will arrive at an agreement about knowledge, uh, is a fallacious argument. Uh, according to uh, Lyotard, is a problematic argument because 
what he says over here is such consensus does violence to the heterogeneity of language games. Now, this is a very key term in um, Lyotard's essay, which we'll, we'll spend some time dealing with uh, in our lectures, language games. This is obviously a term borrowed from Wittgenstein. As you know, uh, language games uh, are the kind of the structural plays and the performative plays in language through which we make meanings uh, through certain pre-existing uh, notes of uh, rules. Uh, we'll talk about language games later. Now, uh, Lyotard says that uh, any kind of a agreement that is arrived at through discussion, through homogeneity, uh, through a public uh, interaction does violence to the heterogeneity of language games. So it does a disservice, in other words, to the heterogeneity, the, the mighty, the healthy heterogeneity of language games, which according to Lyotard must be sort of unpacked, must be opened up, must be encouraged, right, rather than sort of given a closure to an agreement. So the Heber-Mussen idea of agreement uh, through interactions in public space is a very European modernity-based uh, idea of agreement uh, and consensus, which according to Lyotard uh, is a danger because it, is, it, it has a danger of becoming a meta-narrative in its own right. So in other words, he is someone who promotes local narratives, he is someone who promotes micro-narratives, uh, and he is someone who promotes heterogeneity or disagreement uh, as against consensus and agreement and homogeneity in terms of narrative knowledge. So, uh, and then he goes on to say something really interesting, an invention is always born of dissension. So dissent, disagreement, these become very important categories, uh, ontological categories, epistemic categories, and Lyotard, uh, categories of knowledge, right? Uh, because uh, he says invention can only come or can only emerge out of a disagreement, out of dissent. So we shouldn't really aim at homogeneity, we shouldn't really aim at uh, an agreement in the public space, in the public space through discussions, interactions, etc. Rather, we should be aiming at heterogeneity, we should be aiming at dissent, we should be aiming at um, interstitiality, uh, the in-betweenness uh, of categories. And that's something that postmodernism really promotes. Right? So this particular book becomes a template in many ways of postmodernism and it also becomes a very important text for us interested in cultural studies because it shows us a very interesting reflection and a theory of what happened to culture post Second World War, what happened to European culture, what happened to American culture, what happened to Western cultures post Second World War, where this entire idea of the European uh, Enlightenment began to break away and in, in, in this place we began to have different other kinds of knowledges coming in, which is celebrated. And then he gives a very interesting idea of postmodern knowledge. What is postmodern knowledge? Postmodern knowledge is not simply a tool of the authorities. It, it refines our sensitivity to differences and reinforces our ability to tolerate the incommensurable. This is a really remarkable definition. It says it, it's something which trains us to understand incommensurability. Uh, what is incommensurability? It's incompatibility. Right, something which doesn't balance, something which doesn't really add up. Now, this not adding up, this imbalance of propositions, this imbalance of meaning is something that postmodernism refines us to. It trains us to tolerate, it trains us to in, in accommodate these imbalances, these incommensurabilities. Uh, that's something which is very, very important. Uh, and then he says, its principle is not the expert's homology, but the inventor's paralogy. Now, this is very, very crucial. Uh, homology is a homologous understanding of logic is homogeneous logic, is one lateral narrative of logic, uh, which is based on rationality, which is based on reason, which is based on enlightenment, etc. It's a very Cartesian kind of a logic. I think, therefore, I am. The entire logic is premised on the thinking mind, the rational mind, the conscious mind, etc. Uh, and it's very linear, it's very Eurocentric, and it's very male as well. Now, Lyotard contrasts that to uh, paralogy, which is parallel logic, which is an alternative logic. Now, it might be illogical, it might be anti-logic, but that's exactly what postmodernism is interested in. It's interested in uh, you know, a paralogical understanding of the, uh, the, the daily discourse of life. It's a paralogical understanding of the multiverse, not the universe. Right? So against the, hom the homological understanding of modernity, we have a paralogical understanding of postmodernity. Right, and that's a very important, crucial category that Lyotard detonates or calibrates in front of us. And it's very important for us to understand this, uh, especially if you're interested in cultural studies, looking at that from a sort of Marxist, postmodernist perspective. So how these paralogical parameters, uh, they open up uh, a postmodernist post way of looking at life where there's no grand narrative left, where there's no meta narratives left. Uh, and in, in the place of meta narratives, in the place of grand narratives, we have local micro narratives which promote dissent, which promote disagreement, which promote uh, 
non-linearity which promote incommensurability and this idea of incommensurability is something which is celebrated in, in postmodernism right now what this does also immediately as some of you might be thinking of is that it does a very uh, interesting thing to history right because history as we know it um, the, the grand narrative of history is pretty homologous uh, it's a leader narrative it, it it deals with the big figures it deals with big historical figures the grand figures of history will make a difference in a meta ma macro level but you know what postmodernism does is that it brings our attention and redirects our attention to local history to oral history to micro history to micro historical narratives where little figures, small figures, um, quote unquote unimportant figures, they become important, right? Um, you know, and their voices uh, are so sort of dug up, their voices are unpacked, their voices are so sort of read and investigated uh, and contrasted with uh, the hegemonic voices of history, right? So, what th this kind of a attitude does, an attitude of ambivalence, an attitude of incredulity, an attitude of suspicion, an attitude of suspension of meta narratives, what this does essentially is it promotes. The, the small voices, it promotes the subaltern voices, right? Voices which wouldn't otherwise be heard, voices which are buried under the hegemonic voices, right? So postmodernism, in a way, uh, would very quickly ally itself structurally as well as uh, essentially, as well as, uh, you know, spiritually, it would ally, uh, ally itself quite quickly with post colonialism, uh, with gender studies, with subaltern studies, and you can see the structural similarities then, right? So all these are directed against the grand narratives. Uh, which are sort of essentially Eurocentric in the quality. Okay, so, uh, and then he gives a very quick understanding of what this text is. I mean, as I said, this is an introduction, but uh, it's a very useful introduction because it sets out to define what he is about to do. And he gives some very quick but very important definitions in postmodernism, uh, the spirit of postmodernism, the, the ontology of postmodernism, um, etc. And then he moves on to say that the text that follows is an occasional one. It's a report on knowledge in the most highly developed societies and was presented to the consular universities of the government of Quebec at the request of the president. So it was delivered as an address. But uh, what this essentially is, is it's a report on knowledge. What happens in knowledge in a postmodern society? What happens in knowledge? The ontology of knowledge changes. Uh, you know, there's an ontological change in a post-industrial, post-modern society. Uh, the Western societies, the very highly developed societies, right? What happens in knowledge in those societies? Uh, it becomes more disseminated, it becomes more commodified, it becomes more coded in quality. And that's something which, you know, he talks about in more details later. Right. And uh, lastly, he makes a very interesting distinction, which, which we'll spend just a few minutes on. Uh, he says that it remains to be said that the author of this report, uh, this particular book, is a philosopher, not an expert. The latter, the expert knows what he knows and what he does not know. The former does not. One concludes, the other questions. Two very different language games. Right? I combine them here with the result, but neither quite succeeds. So it's a very interesting postmodernist play uh, with ontological categories. So he's saying over oh, well, yeah, here that I'm not, I'm not an expert, I'm a philosopher. And then he delineates the difference between the two. He says an expert knows what he knows as well as what he doesn't know. There's a degree of closure in the expert. Uh, there's a degree of uh, uh, knowledge which relies on closure when it comes to the expert. And expert essentially is someone who extends pre-established knowledge, someone who refines, perfects uh, a pre-established knowledge, whereas a, a philosopher is someone who opens up uh, pre-existing fields of knowledge, someone who questions the pre-existing fields of knowledge. And the philosopher, as it goes on to say, is someone who doesn't quite know what he or she knows or what he or she doesn't know. So. There's a degree of healthy ignorance, a healthy hesitation, healthy ambivalence in the philosopher, which the expert lacks. The expert seems to be sort of uh, pretty cl close and dogmatic in understanding of meaning. Right, so that's something which we need to spend some time on uh, as you move on with this particular book. Uh, the, the idea of the philosopher, the postmodern philosopher, who relies on ambivalence, who relies on uh, hesitation, who relies on uncertainty, rather than, uh, you know, and which is contrasted with the certainty, the dogmatic, the dogged certainty um, that the expert has. So the postmodern philosopher is someone who promotes ambivalence, someone who promotes uncertainty, uh, because that's more allied to uh, the idea of postmodernism in general. Right, so that concludes the introduction of uh, the uh, postmodern condition, and then we move on to the main chapter that Lyotard begins with the idea of knowledge. So, uh, if you come to the first chapter, 
which is entitled The Field, Knowledge and Computerized Societies. So he's essentially saying what happens in knowledge and computerized societies, what happens in knowledge when there's a massive uh, miniaturization of machines and machines become smaller, tinier in size. Uh, what happens in knowledge when uh, knowledge becomes the, the greatest commodity that is competed you know, you know, across countries. I mean, all countries compete with each other to create more and more knowledge. How knowledge becomes more and more plastic in quality. How they can be transferred, translated. Uh, it can travel uh, across media, across geographies, uh, across landscapes, uh, and it can be, you know, in, indefinitely, infinitely, uh, you know, replayed and restored and recorded. Uh, so, what happens to the idea of knowledge in such a society, in such a post-industrial society, which is very highly developed in terms of technology? Okay, so at the very beginning, he sets out the, the he historicizes his research, he historicizes his report, and says, our working hypothesis is that the status of knowledge is altered, that societies enter what we what was known as the post-industrial age, and cultures enter what is known as the post-modern age. Right, so this is a working hypothesis with which, which begins this particular book. He says, the nature of knowledge changes. Uh, it's an ontological change, it's a functional change, it's also an epistemic change. Uh, so there's a a meta quality about this change as well. The knowledge of knowledge changes, so hence is a meta change. Now uh, he defines. He goes on to sort of uh, you know describe or define or highlight the historical phase he's talking about. He says this transition has been underway since uh, at least the end of the 1950s, which for Europe marks the completion of reconstruction. I mean reconstruction from the Second World War. So. Notice also how does a historical overlap uh, between the rise of postmodernism and the fall of the European Empire, so to say. I mean, this is a time where uh, European imperialism was also coming to an end uh, after the Second World War. I mean, the English Empire was coming to an end. Uh, the Belgian Empire has sort of come to an end even before that. Uh, you know, so, so you know, this is obviously allied uh, in spirit, as I said, uh, to what we now call post-colonialism, and that's something which we should be interested in as well when we're doing cultural studies. Now, postmodernism. The rise of postmodernism, uh, so it overlaps with the fall of Eurocentricism uh, to a great extent, and that's something that you know, Lyotard talks about and highlights and, in a way, celebrates. And postmodernism has a celebratory spirit uh, when it comes to the fall of the European idea of meaning, the European idea of society, culture, high culture, etc. So the pace is faster or slower depending on the country, and within countries, it varies according to the sector of activity. The general situation is one of temporal disjunction, which makes sketching an overview difficult. This idea of temporal disjunction is very, very important, and that's something which we should be very interested in culture studies in general, the idea of temporal disjunction. When in the, there's a temporal change, suddenly abrupt changes happen, there's a paradigm shift in culture. So a certain kind of cultural narrative comes to an end, and another kind of cultural narrative begins, and through very sudden temporal changes, so, so certain temporal fragmentations, uh, which are which happened due to economic reasons, which happened due to sort of military reasons sometimes, which happened due to uh, political reasons, ideological reasons, linguistic reasons, etc. Right, okay. <clears throat> Uh, and then he goes on to say, uh, he spent some time talking about scientific knowledge, which in contrast with narrative knowledge. It's a very important you know, contrast, and he sort of builds his entire book on this contrast to a certain extent. And he says, uh, this is page three again, uh, scientific knowledge is a kind of discourse. And it is fair to say, uh, for the last 40 years, the leading sciences and technologies have had to do with language, uh, phonology and theories of linguistics, problems of communication and cybernetics, modern theories of algebra and informatics, computers and the languages, problems of translation, uh, and the search for areas of compatibility among computer languages, problems of information storage and data banks. Uh, so he goes on. But the idea is, he says, how uh, scientific knowledge uh, becomes more and more a, a bit of a service knowledge towards communication. It's uh, obsessed with communication, obsessed with language, obsessed with uh, data about language, data about dissemination, data about you know, uh, you know, communication, control over communication, etc. And then he goes on to say that this is a bit of a political situation where countries fight with each other, not for land anymore, not for military uh, victories anymore, but for information, for data, right? So it's no wonder, it's no surprise that science or scientific knowledge is more and more increasingly directed towards data-based knowledge, uh, towards information-based knowledge, right? So hence this entire array of information-based technology. So uh, because scientific knowledge too is a part of discourse, it can't escape its discursivity. Uh, 
Uh, it's something which is embedded in this ideological discursivity, its ideological condition, its discursive condition. So when the discursive condition becomes more and more oriented to its knowledge, to its communication, to its language, it's no surprise the science too, a scientific knowledge too, becomes more and more consumed by that kind of uh, obsession. Right, okay. Uh, and then uh, he goes on to say that, this is page four, uh, these technological transformations can be expected to have a considerable impact on knowledge. So, you know, he makes a distinction as a very important distinction between technology and science. Right? It doesn't conflate the two. He looks at technology as a manifestation of this kind of a scientific discursivity, where science becomes discursive, scientific knowledge becomes discursive, and hence it produces its technological advancements. But that is not to say that this is scientific knowledge. So he makes a very important distinction between the two kinds of knowledge over here, the two orders of knowledge, scientific knowledge and uh, technological, technological knowledge. Right. Uh, and then he goes on to show uh, the idea, the impact of miniaturization. This is something I have been talking about a little earlier. Uh, it is common knowledge, this should be on the screen, it is common knowledge that the miniaturization and commercialization of machines is already changing the way in which learning is acquired, classified, made available and exploited. Now look at the uh, verbs over here, uh, acquired, classified, made available and exploited. So knowledge becomes uh, a commodity uh, that can be sort of possessed and exploited, can be acquired, uh, can be classified, can be made available, accessible, and then exploited. So a uh, degree of ownership comes with knowledge. So whoever owns knowledge uh, becomes a dominant uh, person, becomes a dominant entity, becomes a dominant category. Uh, whoever doesn't have knowledge becomes the peripheral marginalized category. So knowledge becomes uh, a tool for exploitation to a certain extent, right? So, and this kind of uh, transformation knowledge takes place through massive miniaturization and commercialization, right? So machines become more and more miniaturized. Machines become more and more sort of small, tiny, accessible, uh, translatable, you know, uh, traversable. So, you know, you can travel with those machines all the time. You can take entire knowledge, the entire library uh, into a memory stake, etc. Now, mind you, this is being written uh, way before uh, we have the idea of memory stakes, right? Way before the, the concept of memory stakes, the concept of, you know, CD-ROMs came into being. So in that sense, this becomes a very, very prophetic essay, a very uh, interesting essay which anticipates what will happen to knowledge, what will happen to technology later, right? So that's something that we should be uh, aware of. So in a way, this particular essay, this particular book speaks to us more closely today than what it perhaps did when it was originally written. Right, okay. And then it goes on to say, it is reasonable to suppose that the proliferation of information processing machines is having and will continue to have uh, as much of an effect on the circulation of learning as it did advancements in human circulation, transportation systems, and later in the circulation of sounds and visual images. So he says this is perhaps the biggest impact of uh, scientific knowledge today, the idea of you know, information processing. And information processing becomes the be all and end all of scientific knowledge at this point of time because that's tied, that's related to the discursive conditions of these times, which are relied, which are obsessed with information, right? I mean, in order to be discursively dominant, in order to be uh, politically dominant, in order to be culturally dominant, you need to possess information. And that's the kind of culture we inhabit today, Leotard argues. So it's no surprise at all that entire scientific knowledge is at a service of this discursive need, and hence the entire scientific knowledge is directed to us, this discursive need of information processing. Okay, uh, and then he delineates, it gives you a very graphic idea of how the, the nature of knowledge changes under these conditions. And he says, and I quote, this should be on the screen, the nature of knowledge cannot survive unchanged within this context of general transformation. It can fit into the new channels and become operational only if learning is translated into quantities of information. So again, look at the quantifiability, quantifiability of information, right? So an information becomes completely quantifiable, calibrated, uh, it can be broken down into units and everything obviously uh, is related to the massive commodification of information. It becomes a commodity in its own right. And obviously, for something to become a commodity, it should be quantifiable to a certain extent. It should have a price tag. It should have a value in the market or exchange, right? So he says, uh, and the knowledge can fit in new channels, the new channels of knowledge, uh, which are endlessly, you know, disseminated, endlessly accessible, endlessly consumed, and becomes operational only if learning is translated into quantities of information. So learning uh, becomes 
indistinguishable from information, a counter leotard. So, you know, learning and, and, and information become the same thing uh, in this kind of a cultural condition where knowledge and technology, scientific knowledge and technology become enmeshed uh, over here. So, uh, and then he says, we can predict that anything in the constituted body of knowledge that is not translatable in this way will be abundant and that the direction of new research will be dictated by the possibility of its eventual results being translatable in the computer language. Right? So everything should be translatable in a computer language, you know, otherwise it will be abandoned uh, by um, the contemporary you know, dominant scientific narratives. In other words, this is the demand of the market, this is the demand of the mercantile um, you know, culture which requires translation, which requires knowledge to become uh, something of a coded program in a computer, which then can be endlessly disseminated, endlessly you know, sent out and endlessly accessed and consumed uh, by users and by the market uh, together. Right? So in other words, uh, Lyotard is looking at a condition where learning and knowledge uh, become synonymous with information. Right. So there's no ontological difference in this kind of a cultural condition between learning and information, between knowledge and information. So information is knowledge, knowledge is information in this kind of a culture. And this entire uh, degradation or rather you know, transition of knowledge into information, it requires certain kind of a scientific apparatus. An entire scientific pursuit of knowledge is not reliant on technology, is not reliant on information-based machi machines, etc., because those are required uh, in order for, you know, to contain that knowledge, which will become data, uh, discursive data, which will then be disseminated and consumed and coded uh, in a culture we inhabit today. So this is a condition that Lyotard talks about, and this is a condition which Lyotard says requires a re-look at science, because scientific knowledge changes, it cannot but change in this kind of a political condition. Uh, it must be at the service of the discursive needs of the market at the time, which will require every kind of knowledge to become information. So entire scientific pursuit is you know, geared to us, information processing machines, and that's something that Lyotard is sort of highlighting in this particular section. Right, okay. <clears throat> So, if we come to the end of this page, uh, he talks about what happens to knowledge. Uh, knowledge is and will be produced in order to be sold. It is and will be consumed in order to be valorized in a new production. In both cases, the goal is exchange. Knowledge ceases to be an end in itself. It loses its use value. So, I mean, no one really pursues knowledge for its own end. Uh, it is just a medium. It's just something which is exchanged endlessly, right? And so it must be consumed, it must be sold, it must be valorized and a new production. So the entire uh, politics of production over here changes and knowledge becomes something which is a commodity, something which is packaged, uh, something which is something which has had a body, something which is exteriorized uh, to different apparatus. Now it could be computer apparatus, it could be other mercantile apparatus, but the point is it is something which is endlessly packaged and sold and dished out and consumed, right? Uh, and it, uses, it, it loses use value, so it doesn't really have any use value anymore, apart from being a medium of information. That's the key thing that uh, uh, Lyotard talks about. Knowledge must become, uh, in this condition, a medium of information. Apart from that, it doesn't have any value at all. Okay. Uh, so, and this, this is the politics of knowledge that I just mentioned, and this is what Lyotard talks about, how uh, political, how nation heads, how political parties, how political categories that compete with each other uh, for accessing knowledge. And he says, it is widely accepted that knowledge has become the principal force of production over the last few decades. This has already had a noticeable effect on the comp composition of the workforce of the most highly developed countries and constitutes a major bottleneck for the developing countries. In the post-industrial and post-modern age, science will maintain and no doubt strengthen its preeminence in the arsenal of productive capacities of the nation states. Indeed, this situation uh, is one of the reasons leading to the conclusion that a gap between developed and developing countries will grow ever wider in the future. Right. So, uh, this is a very interesting uh, link that Lyotard is making, a link between uh, the transition, the transformation in the body of knowledge, in the ontology of knowledge, and the knowledge of knowledge, and how that has its reflections in the real political situations, right? So, 
if we come to uh, the post-industrial and post-modern societies, we find that the, the gap between the developed and developing countries lies precisely at the level of knowledge. The developed countries have more knowledge. They can process knowledge better. Uh, everything becomes knowledge. The market becomes knowledge. Uh, you know, uh, we have knowledge of share market. We have knowledge of the economy. We have knowledge of the politics. Everything becomes a knowledge industry in a certain sense. Whereas developing countries, uh, they aspire to have the knowledge industry. And therein lies the gap. The gap is an epistemic gap, but it's also an information gap, right? So epistem and information become blended with each other in this kind of a situation. So this is basically, uh, you know, what Lyotard talks about. And then he goes on to say uh, in this particular section, the knowledge in the form of an informational commodity indispensable to productive power is already and will continue to be a major, perhaps the major stake in a worldwide competition for power. So this is a, a very Foucauldian idea of knowledge and power, but this takes a more massive, a more macro scale where nations compete with each other for knowledge and power, because knowledge is power, information is power, right? So it becomes informational commodity. So this transition uh, that knowledge has from being uh, a category, uh, an episteme in itself, an end in itself with use value, uh, from that particular kind of an ontological status, it becomes an informational commodity where it just has to be sold and accessed and resold and you know uh, disseminated through media. Is something which has its replications in a political situation as well, where he says that nation hates compete with each other for knowledge uh, at this point of time. And he actually says that quite clearly, uh, it is conceivable that nation states will one day fight for control of information just as they battled in the past for control over territory and afterwards for control of, of access to an exploitation of raw materials and cheap labor. A new field is open for industrial and commercial strategies on the one hand and political and military strategies on the other. Right. So I conclude the lecture here today, but just in passing, this is a very interesting description of knowledge, uh, how knowledge becomes an industry, and how this knowledge industry has its replications in a political uh, field, in a, a real political situation, where he says, a day will come when nation hates will fight with each other for knowledge. And you know, this, in a way, is quite prophetic, because today we're living in an era where countries blame each other for rigging the elections. So if you just think of the American elections, where there's a theory, a speculation that you know it was rigged, it was uh, intervened uh, by Russia uh, to a certain kind of a knowledge crashing system, a certain kind of information crashing system. So we're looking at a new kind of terrorism, we're looking at a new kind of military warfare where we don't really have machine guns, don't really have bombs, we just have computers and knowledge based, information based ammunition, right? So ammunition becomes information, information becomes ammunition, and countries fight with each other for control of information, right? An entire idea of knowledge becomes information. So, you know, this obviously has replications in science and scientific knowledge, which is directed completely towards producing and reproducing uh, and classifying and coding knowledge into information, because that becomes the, the, more, the, the major commodity, the most important commodity, uh, which is aspired for uh, is by the nation heads, which is something which nations want to own, which is something which nations you know, want to privilege themselves with, etc. And you know, the idea of a developed country uh, depends on the extent to which the developed country has knowledge, right? Uh, to what extent does it have the information about itself, about its economy, about other countries, about its neighboring countries, etc. Right? So, you know, this is a very interesting essay and it obviously has replications in cultural studies, massive replications in cultural studies, because, you know, it's something which reflects the kind of culture we inhabit today. It's, it's anticipating the kind of culture we inhabit today and also uh, it gives us very interesting theories with which we can look at the culture as we consume today, right? So I conclude the lecture today and we'll continue with this uh, in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.